I hope you don't get the sickness. Kurt is a stay-at-home dad Watching Disney movies he never had His daughter digs through all the VHS Crushing the classics in a princess dress Informed like Scuttle, Kurt's got your ticket Making it real like Jiminy Cricket Most are off the Captain Hook, but if the Tweedledum He'll be taking more shots than Bambi's mom Leave some rays like Simba or crack like the beast dishes He'll show you a whole new world You won't need three wishes Stay-at-home Disney dad The year was 2000, and those of us lucky enough to survive Y2K were rewarded with Emperor's New Groove. On the VHS tape, we start with a reminder about how the DVD meteorite is about to rid the world of the prehistoric VHS tapes. Ad for Atlantis in DVD, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs coming to DVD and VHS. There's something so depressing about the way they tag that on. It makes it sound like, here's what the DVD looks like, and oh, and here's also the VHS if you're homeless. Jennifer Love Hewitt is Madeline in Hunchback, too. I like that movie. She says it's one of the best love stories you could ever tell. She thinks you'll want it in your house so you can watch it again and again. She says that. I mean, settle down, Jen. She says that as she's looking slightly off camera where I imagine some Disney exec is nodding as she talks and peeling off bills. It's the greatest love story? And? And you'll, you'll want to buy it? Feature presentation. Lama in the rain. Meet her David Spade. David Spade is Cusco. David Spade working for Disney is really fun to think about. The llama used to be human and a king. Let's go back in time. He's an emperor. He controls everyone. The chef, the butler, the theme song guy. The singer starts up again. That was kind of funny. Someone throws off the emperor's groove and we go to a wide shot of the castle and we see that guy getting thrown to his death. Ha <laughs> ha, bleak. They parade possible wives in front of him and he denies them all. We meet the people who bright him down. What does that mean? That's got to be a typo. Brought him down? Hashtag one take. And we meet Pacha and Esma, the emperor's advisor and her second cronk voiced by the guy who tells you to put on your seatbelt when you ride Soren in uh, Epcot. The emperor is a jerk. He fires Esma. Pacha arrives and the emperor shows him a model of his village. The emperor asks which area gets the most sun. See, the emperor is going to destroy Pacha's town so he can build a giant house for himself. Pacha is upset and Cusco has him thrown out. Esma and Kronk plot and scheme. Esma is like a sorceress and wants to turn the emperor into a flea or she can just poison him. Uh, they make him a nice supper and he doesn't suspect a thing. Kronk mixes up the drink and it starts burning then he mixes them all up together because he's a bumbler Cusco drinks it and falls dead then pops back up to life and starts turning into a llama here we go he turns into a llama and doesn't notice he's turned into a llama so Kronk does what anyone who just tried to murder someone but instead accidentally turned them into a llama would do he knocks him out with a broccoli plate yep Esma takes Kronk, uh, Esma tells Kronk to take him out of town and kill him. Kronk puts him in a giant sack and tosses him into some stream. They do the angel and devil on his shoulder thing, and it doesn't really go anywhere. He jumps in and saves him, of course he does. Uh, he, then he steps on a cat's tail and accidentally drops the llama, and the llama bag rolls down these elaborate staircases and into town, and he loses Cusco. He looks into the camera and says, he hopes that doesn't come back to haunt him. He takes a lot of fun out of making, cla making fun of classic Disney foreshadowing by making fun of it himself. We return to the village where Paka returns home. Did I mention that he's voiced by John Goodman, the same guy that was Sully and Big Mug? He has two kids and a pregnant wife, and, I, and he can't bring himself to tell them what's going to happen to the village. The escaped llama meets Pacha, and Pacha tells him he's a llama, which I guess he didn't know until now. Llama wants to help. Pacha says he will help him if he builds his summer home somewhere else. Llama says no deal, and he goes into the jungle against Pacha's advice. Pacha says that's fine. If he dies, he won't build a summer home. In the jungle, Cusco immediately runs into a bunch of panthers who want to eat him. Of course, Pacha has a change of heart and saves him, and we're in, like, Buddy cop territory. Mm -hmm. Back at the castle, there's a funeral for the emperor, and Esma starts redecorating immediately. Kronk starts over talking about how Cusco is, uh, is officially dead. She knows he bumbled it, and Cusco is actually still alive. She's like, okay, we need to find him and kill him. Can't see I was just super excited about Patch and Cusco bickering while trying to make a campfire, but this turn of events is kind of drawing me to the movie. I say that, and now we get more filler where Patch and Cusco are forced to get along and work together in order to survive. 
survive in the harsh jungle elements. For a newer movie with Hollywood star power, this should have, uh, I don't want to say better, but like tighter script. Pacha and Cusco have helped each other stay alive, and Esma and Kronk search through the jungle for the llama. Nothing worth writing about has happened in like 15 minutes. Now the llama is hungry, so they dress Cusco up as a woman, and Pacha takes her out for supper. Turns out Esma and Kronk are sitting at the table behind them. Pacha overhears how they are going to kill Cusco and drags the llama out the back door of the restaurant. There's a misunderstanding and Cusco tells off Pacha and he storms off. Cusco immediately overhears Esma and Kronk verbalize their plan to murder Cusco, but they got the potions mixed up, mixed up or caught up. We're back to the start of the movie where sad llama is in the rain. Okay, Kronk wakes up and finally remembers who Pacha is. The jig is up. Pacha and Kronk make up. Uh, Pacha did promise he would help Kronk become human again, so they stop at Pacha's place to get some supplies, but realize that Esmond Kronk have figured out Pacha has Cusco and is at Pacha's house looking for them already. Pacha's wife is all sassy and awesome and knows what's up. Pacha knows he has to get Cusco back to the castle and get him turned back into a human. So they leave Esma and Kronk at Pacha's house, where the wife and kids basically like honey slash tar and feather her. This is so goofy, okay? It's like a foot race back to the castle, and there's just so much visual gaggery they all arrive at the castle's laboratory and she has the cure suddenly there's an adult joke where she where she says i'll bet you weren't expecting this and starts lifting her dress and everyone screams but it turns out she just has a giant knife in her garter and everyone is relieved because she's just going to kill them instead of revealing her lady bits It's like around this point, the Disney people just handed the script over to David Spade and took the rest of the week off. Esma gets mad at Kronk and all the potions and remedies get mixed up. Some soldiers get turned into animals while trying to escape. Patch and Cusco start taking turns and taking, they're turning to animals. I'm having a hard time focusing here. This is like sword in the stone stuff. Uh, they're down to two vials. One turns Esma into a kitty as Pacha hangs from a ledge. Check that Lion King box. The kitty tries to steal the last vial, but falls and teeters, and Cusco has to decide whether to save Pacha or the vial. At the last second, he saves Pacha. There's a trampoline set up below them, so the vial bounces back up, and Pacha feeds the llama the potion, and he turns back into the emperor. Fast forward. Cusco is apologizing to the old man he threw out the window at the start of the movie. We try to have like a sweet moment here as Cusco says he didn't actually like the hill Pacha lives on and doesn't want to live there after all. He ends up building his summer house on the next hill over. There's a music montage of everyone getting along in the future. And there's one scene where a happy human Cusco hugs a happy Pacha's wife. Weird way to end a weird movie. This is one of those movies where there's so much vague filler for a feature Disney movie made in the last two decades. Watching this back in like 2000, I feel like you would have just walked out of the theater. Not confident enough to say there were some really uninteresting parts here, though, just in case like I didn't get some imagery and I don't want to look stupid if someone comes up to me later and says, you didn't get how this movie was actually about the inevitable slow mass extinction of the honeybees. And you go, oh, yeah, of course I did. Oh, I also didn't mention that part where they're about to go over the waterfall and they're all like, there's a waterfall there, isn't there? Yep. 70 foot drop. Yep. Sharp rocks at the bottom. Probably. I've just never been a fan of like peppering that kind of cliche exposing humor to movies. It's such a delicate line to ride and even if you manage to make it funny, no movie maker can really ever do it again without looking tired and silly, right? Like it's a dangerous game to play even if it's fun at the time. I'm a big horror movie fan guy and I, I like to think Scream is a brilliant movie, right? That's what people say. It dissects and exposes all horror movie tropes but like no one can make a regular horror movie after that. And we had to move, we moved on to like found footage and later importing ideas from Japan. I know it takes, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say here. You know, it's like in wrestling in 1997 where they started winking at the audience. Being, you were a bad guy. I was a good guy. Like, where do you go from there? You know, like it's fun at the time, but like there's, there's, there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go once you've exposed something like that. So you use the cliche and they point out how everybody goes over the water. You know, there's nowhere to go. I'm not going to lie, my teleprompter ended, so I'm trying to figure out how I actually was supposed to stop this thing. Uh, yeah, um, it's bizarre. Okay, prompter's gone. Anyway, uh, you know, I sometimes grip my teeth at how celebrities win the lottery and get these voice gigs. But you know what? David Spade does a really good job. I don't know. Very little happens in 90 minutes in this movie. That's what I think of. What do you think? What we have is a concern about Curtis Anderson. His interviewing style is not the best. His personal appearance is not the best. I was wondering if the man has some kind of a hold over the channel that uh, he's allowed to be employed for so long with the standards of journalism and personal.
personal appearance that he has.